So where, where are we going to come in on this? Well, really, what I wanted to do is say, let's talk about policy, because nothing appears without it being discussed somewhere and somebody coming up the agent with the agenda to make it happen. It doesn't matter what the subject is, somebody somewhere has sat in a room discussing what they think should happen and that's then translated into policy and the policy is then pushed through the political system and then it becomes factual in as much as it's implemented, it can be supported by rules and regulation, wider law, can be enforced by the law. But whatever we see coming in, we've got to think in terms of policy, and I'm going to keep pushing. Policy doesn't create itself. Policy is created by men and women sitting in rooms discussing things. And often, of course, they're sitting in rooms which are semi-secret. Chatham House rules, you can talk about what was said but not who said it, or they're secret in as much as you never even knew the meeting took place. Here's a bit of a definition of policy, a course or principle of action adopted or proposed by an organisation or individual. And archaic was quite interesting because it said prudent or expedient conduct or action. But there we are, we know that people are talking about adopting a particular thing. And 5G's coming along. I went for a quick look on the internet, see what I could see with regard to 5G and policy, and I found this article. I scan read it. My point is just that here's 5G, and we happen to have it alongside the magic word of policy. And this was quite an interesting article um, from Spectrum, so you can always go and have a read of it yourself. Uh, but this bit was particularly interesting because it says in March this year the UK government published a 5G strategy. My view is it opens the door to start moving towards a more sensible vision for 5G. Well, for strategy, read policy, because what that little insert is talking about is the fact that the government policy is to bring 5G in whether or not we like it. In fact, has it ever been discussed with the wider public? I'm going to suggest it. It hasn't. So we've got lots of different types of policy at the moment. This is a very topical one because we've got censorship. This is coming in very, very quickly. The predictions of a lot of people are that next year we can start, we can expect to see new legislation aiming to try and shut down alternative and free media sites. Why do I think this is happening? I think this is happening because the government is getting very, very worried about the amount of alternative media and the fact that alternative media is now pumping out very good material. There's a lot of people now joining in, doing videos, but they're producing material which is accurate, it's evidence-based, and this is starting to give the government a problem. So we can expect to see more on the censorship policy. Uh, if it really comes in, we're going to lose the UK column. I work, of course, alongside Mike Robinson with the UK column. We have done now for however long it is, 10 plus years. Um, but we know they're, they're slowly but surely coming after us. Um, whatever we think of um, Alex Jones, uh, we can see that they're going for him as well. And if we do not have free speech, then, of course, we are very quickly into a dictatorship. It's very dangerous times, but it all comes from a policy. Here's the Liberal Democrat voice, devolution to the English regions. Well, where did the devolution policy come from? I'm going to suggest that part of this policy, where the government says this is giving more power at local level, is the, one of the biggest lies told, because the regional policy is, is effectively European Union policy, where the aim is to draw us into the European super state. But nevertheless, whether you agree with it or not, the key thing is this is a policy. Accelerating growth, Edinburgh, South East Scotland, city region deal. Well, this is another very major policy which they're pushing in where forget about your country, what you're interested in is city states. And the city states are now moving into AI and cross border. Uh, maybe Graham Downing will mention that a bit, but he's, he's taught me quite a lot about this. So if you've never heard of the city region policy, 
there's a policy, somebody in a room discussed it. Who were they? Now, this really annoys me, this sort of thing, because um, we're not to think like this young lady, because she's got a hijab on. We're not to think like that. The BBC thinks that we should think like this. And this is being pushed very, very, very hard. Um, so what we've got is a social morality policy. The one on the right is wrong. The one on the left is supposedly correct. Now, maybe a reasonable person would say, perhaps there's a balance in the middle, but I hope you get my point. The BBC is enacting a policy, and that policy is an attack on social morality um, by promoting... It's not Lady Gaga, I always get it wrong, it's Madonna, isn't it? But there's more and more of these sort of photographs, and there are more and more images particularly targeted at young people. So my point is, which is the one we feel more comfortable with? And for me, it's not the BBC, but it's policy. We've got a policy apparently in force to protect prisoners and make sure that they get medical care. Some of you might recognise this lady down here, Melanie Shaw. She's an abuse survivor and whistleblower. She has had unbelievable abuse inside the English prison system. Uh, including over 18 months in solitary confinement, which the UN defines as torture. And for one long period, you might just make it out down here, she had a major leg ulcer, which was never treated the whole time she, she was in prison. In fact, she was given dishcloths to use as bandages. Right? Now, there is a policy that the government looks after prisoners, um, but of course that policy is an utter lie. So I'm just gently saying to you that even where we see the government talking about a policy, it doesn't have to be a real policy because they might think they can get political public advantage out of lying to the public. Um, we can see it in other areas. I'm sort of sticking on a theme here, but um, there's Ted Heath. Um, I believe Ted Heath was a vicious paedophile. I, don't have any doubts about that personally. Um, Melanie Shaw is pretty, pretty sure about that as well, the lady who's in prison. But on the right is a prison governor, and that prison governor has been making up her own law effectively because she's prevented social workers getting into the prison to see Melanie, which they should do. They have an obligation under law because Melanie's registered disabled. Uh, but the prison governor has made sure those social workers have never got in to see Melanie. And more recently, she's also blocked the visits of legal team for Melanie. So this lady seems to be able to make up her own policy despite the law. So now we're getting in a little bit deeper. We've got a law, but apparently the law only fits certain people, and it depends what the policy is. I can't resist putting up Theresa May because, of course, she was the woman who was Home Secretary when this vulnerable lady went into prison. So ultimately, all the decisions rested with her. But as you can see at the bottom left, she was more interested in attacking Trump than she was in protecting this immensely vulnerable lady on the right. So Theresa May stands on the world stage. Her policy is, I protect women. No, she doesn't, because this lady has been brutalised under her very system. But it's policy. Now, this is one which uh, probably motivates some of you, vaccines. There is no law in this country which says you or your children have to be vaccinated. That is fact. In fact, there is a test case recently where a lady made sure that she challenged the fact that she was being told that her children needed vaccinations. And she won that case, and the judge in his findings said that if the children were to be forcibly vaccinated by the local authority, that would amount to assault. But the basis in UK today is that there is no law in place which says that you must vaccinate your children. Despite that, the government is pushing and pushing for people to be vaccinated, and this is the sort of information they use to form the policy. It's OK before, because the World Health Organisation says so. Policy. 
And if the government says it, of course, the NHS is absolutely hammering it. So never mind the law, the NHS is pushing that people should be vaccinated. There's a test case at the moment with a young man who was going to do a physiotherapy course at Cardiff University. They said he had to be vaccinated. He asked for the uh, documentation in the university. None was produced. Uh, so he fought and said, there is no law. And they said, you can't do the course. Uh, when he tried to log on to a course at another university in UK, he was found he was blocked in all of them. But there is no law to say that he or anybody else must be vaccinated. So now we've got a real twist. We can see that the government can produce policy which is actually counter to our own law, but it doesn't matter. They're desperate to get that policy through. Our police, do we have any police in the audience today? I hope we do, because we we're always keen to talk to them. So maybe there is, maybe there isn't, we don't know. Um, here's the police, here's uh, a policy. The programmes will transform how police use technology, make it easier for the public to engage with police online and boost capacity to deal with major threats. This is all about the police beginning to group together. In Scotland, uh, where there was originally eight, I think, different police forces, they've all amalgamated into one, Police Scotland. So if the police are involved in anything untoward, who is the independent authority that investigates them? There is only one police force, there's one state. So Scotland is getting very dangerous on the policy that the police were all to be amalgamated. And that is the policy that is being pushed very quickly here. So you might have heard about Devon and Cornwall police amalgamating with Somerset and Dorset police. This is part of the regionalisation policy. Um, this one, when we discovered it, I just found absolutely horrific. This is the BBC's charity, BBC Media Action, boasting that they had people on the ground in Syria in 2004 working with the opposition to essentially help achieve regime change. And my question is, uh, was this just BBC policy or was this actually government foreign office policy? Here she is boasting that the BBC was in that country working with people in the opposition. Were they reasonable opposition? Were they dangerous opposition? Were they terrorists? We've no way of knowing. But this is a charity, supposedly, but it's, it's clearly enacting a policy. And if you look at the funding for BBC Media Action, you'll find that a lot of the money comes from government sources. It comes from the US. It comes from, I think it was Denmark and UK, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as well. So it's policy and first comes the policy and then comes the event. None of this discussed with the British public. And the law is under big attack at the moment. So this lady, Lady Hale, spoke out recently and she said that basically the courts, judiciary, the whole of the legal system is, she said, facing serious challenges, but challenge is a new word for problem. That's what we would have called it many years ago. It was a problem, a very big problem. And uh, this leads us to the point at the moment that there is a policy that the law as we've known it is to be changed. So I say to you as an audience, are you all aware that many courts are closing? It's getting more difficult to get to a local court. And many of the courts are now banning the public from actually going into the court. And even if you do go into the court, as the people who went into Melanie Shaw's court case said in Leeds, the public were behind an opaque screen. Melanie was behind about four inches of safety glass. So they could neither see justice being done and they couldn't hear it properly. Uh, but this is the state of courts in UK. And the policy is that people will not necessarily appear in court in person because they can be brought in by a video link. And if you think of the implications of that, it means none of the human characteristics that we often rely upon, what was the expression on somebody's face, what were they doing, what was their body language, what did you feel about them, all of that taken away, you will just have a person on a video link. 
And what we've seen with Melanie in other cases is those video links have mysteriously failed just at the moment Melanie and other people were able to start putting their own defence forward. So there is a policy at the moment, the courts are going to be closed, more AI is going to be brought into the court system, and this has never, ever been debated in a public capacity. Well, Bob Neill, Chair of the Justice Committee, uh, an effective criminal justice system is one of the pillars on which the rule of law is built. Uh, this is all to do with a funding crisis, because there's no money, but if we get into where money comes from, we can see that this is a created problem. I haven't got time to get into it in detail, but I'm just going to suggest to you that all the problems in the court at the moment is policy, which is being created. Uh, he went on a bit here because he says there's a common law right to legal advice, but actually the policy in the legal system over a great many years has been to remove common law. And this is very, very dangerous because it's the common law which gives us all the protections as human beings. All of the statute law, rule after rule after rule, thousands of them, this has mainly come in using the European system, where essentially you're guilty until proved innocent. Um, but what we can say with great confidence is there's a policy being enacted at the moment to completely destroy common law. So here we are, policy. It doesn't just happen on its own. The moment you're on the trail of policy, the 5G policy, who made that decision? And this is where it gets quite difficult because basically you don't necessarily know. I'm just using an example here. But if we talk about immigration, no doubt that will start some twitches. But this man, uh, Peter Sutherland, Bilderberger, immense power, including with the UN, said that we need more immigration, not for the benefit of the people moving, but in order to break down nation states. The immigra immigrants were to be used as a cruel tool in order to break down nation states. Uh, he's died. I don't think that's a great loss, um, but an immensely powerful man and immensely powerful work in the B Bilderbergers. So when we talk about immigration as a policy, where was it created? We start to get a clue because this is a man prepared to discuss how it was created and why. Just an example. Uh, here's David Cameron, and Ken Clark was saying that uh, if, if there was a Brexit vote, he would have to resign. Uh, so my point is that somebody in the Tory party was producing a policy. And it seems in this case that Ken Clark was one of the leaders of it. If anybody's done a bit of research on the internet, you might like to look at the names Ken Clark and Ben Fellows and see what you find. Here's the uh, 2013, is it, Bilderberg meeting. Uh, these people were assembled in rooms behind closed doors to discuss things. There were no minutes produced for the public. There were no notes produced for the public. Uh, but we had senior bankers meeting with senior members of the British parliamentary system. My question is, what was discussed behind closed doors? And my strong guess is that those bankers weren't there for fun. What they were doing is discussing policy, their policies. So we're in a tremendously dangerous state in this country at the moment because there's this veneer that everything is OK. But actually, when we really get into it, we see that under the surface, it's corporate banking interests which are the power base. And it's their policies which are coming through. And I'm going to suggest to you that if we get into the 5G argument, we will start to see it's those big corporate telecommunications companies which say we need 5G. It's not the public saying we need it, please give it to us. It's you need it, we're going to make sure you have it. But it's easy to start following the trail of who's got the power base. Well, if we look at the Conservatives, let's just run through how, how they really work. It's the same for all the major uh, political parties. We need a puppet who's respectable, and then we've got to reinforce the puppet with big funders. 
Conservative Party couldn't work without funding. Same with Labour, same with the Lib Dems. So if you want to know where the power base is, you've got to go for the funders. Uh, we've got to have powerful lobbyists. These are the first line of the policy makers. And it is amazing to see the power that comes in behind the Conservatives. Now, I've mentioned Conservative Friends of Israel there. Conser uh, there, are, there are Friends of Israel across all the parties. But I've put it in there because they have and boast about their power within the Conservative Party. Their power to influence over 80 and maybe 90 MPs now. And I've often said, I don't particularly mind that this is Israel, it could be Italy, I would still be concerned. So, policy. We've got a cabinet office which acts in a very secretive way now, making a huge amount of policy, never debated in Parliament, and not even the bank back, backbenchers, excuse me, know what is necessarily happening in the cabinet office. Conservative central office, this is where it starts to get nasty because this is where MPs are controlled, the Conservative MPs are controlled. Uh, we've got a PR team, you've got to be able to spin the uh, news, you've got to be able to pull the wool over people's eyes. And if anybody doesn't know about the Behavioural Insights team, then you need to. I'm going to show you a bit more on that. But we are now into realms that they're not even just changing what we do through open policy, they're now using applied behavioural psychology to change our behaviour without us knowing it. And I'm going to prove that in a minute. So where could we go? Well, we've got conservative associations, we've got the grassroots people, um, we've got the change agents, we'll move on to them in a minute. They're people pushing policy. And we've got the backbench MPs. I couldn't resist putting Gary Streeter and Johnny Mercer in because having had some dealings with these two, they have not got a clue what's going on. Johnny Mercer even said so effectively. Uh, publicly that he didn't really know what went on at the higher levels. So there's your elected representative, or for some people, doesn't know what's going on. And this is where it gets nasty, because then we've got the whips. And what the whips about were there to make sure you follow conservative policy. And we know how this works, because this man, Tim Fortescue, is on a BBC video, if you just Google or search for Tim Fortescue, you can see a video clip where he tells you that when he was a whip, MPs came to them with all sorts of problems. It could be anything, it could be little boys. And we fixed it because, well, if we fixed it for them, they would do as we asked. Here is a Conservative MP, former whip, admitting that they used blackmail over subjects like the abuse of children in order to force through Tory policy. Welcome to Britain in 2018, but of course that was going on back in 1973. This is Heath administration. You can go and see that yourself. And then we've got all the Conservative voters who vote Conservative because they don't know this is going on. If you think I'm picking on the Tories, it applies to Labour and the other parties equally. So this is unfortunately the world we think we live in. So we elect these people. They've got a, uh, an orchestrated force, the civil service, which is apolitical. And the civil service helps put the policy together. And then that looks after our welfare. But that's absolutely not what's going on. Because all of these organisations, this is a tiny fraction of them, are the organisations forming policy. Their common purpose, there's the Young Foundation, there's the Roundtree Foundation, um, there's various leadership ones, there's uh, um, the Work Foundation, Oxford University, say, business school. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And these are the people forming policy. And now what they're doing is pushing that policy through a new created sector which Tony Blair, I think, initially called the third sector. But it's that mass of organisations, charities, non-government organisations, which form the policy, and the policy is then pushed into the civil service to become enacted at law and to come out onto the streets. 
So we're stuck in this column here. We think we're in a democracy. No, we're not, because all those other agencies are the ones driving the political agenda. And how can they do that? Well, of course, they can do it because they've got shed loads of money coming in. So if you research any of those organisations, try the Young Foundation, because that's tied in with Dartington, you'll find that huge amounts of money are coming into the background. Common Purpose, one pernicious charity that I've spent years trying to expose. How was it that this lady knew in 2007 uh, that there was going to be a, um, a joining up of the Conservatives and the Lib Dems, a coalition? How did she know? The public didn't know. And look at the word she used, guile. That to me means deceit. Had they got sufficient guile to form this? So buried in the heart of government, you've got common purpose. And what's common purpose doing? Forming policy. And the policy coming out of common purpose is not nice. So the policy gets implemented and you really need to know about this. How many people in this room have read about the Behavioural Insights team? Yeah, very few, right? This outfit was initially buried in the Cabinet Office. It's now, a, um, what do they call it, a social interest company or something like that. These people were working right at the heart of the government to show how our behaviour could be changed without us knowing they'd done it. This is not a joke, this is absolutely real. You can see this afterwards by freezing it on screen if you watch the video. Um, but this is a bit about them and what they say they're there to do. It's all good stuff. If, if they treat us the right way, we'll pay our taxes a bit quicker. It's going to move on. Here's some of the people. I have to put my glasses on for this. Um, so Dan is best known for his work on choice architecture as it relates to retirement saving and organ donation. Do you feel comfortable with that? Retirement saving and organ donation. Uh, who is he? He's a Microsoft man. Working within a department of the British government, boasting about using applied psychology to change people's behaviour. And I will tell you as a fact that NHS hospitals now harvesting organs, not only from elderly people, but also from very young people. The reports coming in are constant, they're accurate, they're from different parts of the country. It's very, very dangerous stuff. So what was that man doing? Uh, we've got Richard Thaler, he's one of the experts on using this applied psychology. So he's working with the British government. Um, Nick here is a professor of behavioural science at Warwick Business School. These are shrinks playing with our minds. So we've got a Behavioural Insights team man, Rockefeller Foundation, Santander, Prudential Insurance. They're messing around with behavioural science, but they're also big money people. They're really interested in profit. Um, this lady I didn't like the look of, Director of Behaviour and Health Research at the University of Cambridge. Uh, particularly uh, interventions targeting non-conscious processes. Right? Gus O'Donnell, it was blank, but this is a very dangerous man because he's been heavily involved with Common Purpose. He was called God at one stage because he was so powerful within the Cabinet Office. Civil servant, um, my opinion, a very dangerous person. So here's the Behavioural Insights team that 95% of this room didn't know about. And these are the people linked with it. What do we know about these people? What do we know about their morality, their values? Nothing. And yet these are the people producing policy. And this is the document. You can just go and search for this online. It's called Mindspace. Uh, and it is, um, does it, what does it say here? Influencing behaviour through public policy. Mindspace effects depend at least partly on automatic influences on behaviour. This means that citizens may not fully realise that their behaviour is being changed, or at least how it's being changed. Would you trust Tony Blair to change your behaviour? No. This is where it gets serious. We have no idea who these people are, but they are forming policy. And there's 
a lot of words about it which you can read about how this thing works. But that document, you just search for Mindspace PDF, you can read it and check it yourselves. And here is Tony Blair boasting that he is um, very good at absorbing others' pain. I think he gets off on the pain, actually, which is why he's helped create so many wars. But this man was winding up common purpose and was winding up behavioural insights. So this is not a joke, I'm not making it up. These people were implementing this stuff to change the way we think. Here's um, Gary Streeter. He doesn't know what's going on when I tried to point out to him that the submarine fleet, the nuclear submarine fleet, couldn't go to sea. I'm an ex-Navy guy of many years ago, but a professional military person originally. Uh, I got a load of abuse back from him. The fact was we possibly had one operational nuclear submarine. The bombers, the ballistic boats were at sea. The others were in a pitiful state. And the same with the frigates. And all he gave me was abuse. So arrogance and ignorance is what allows this policy issue to go through. So what's the ultimate policy? Well, it's this. You might have heard of big society. David Cameron talked about it. It was in the press and the media for a while and then it disappeared. Well, it didn't disappear. Because the policy ultimately is to control every single aspect of our lives. This is cabinet office, I call it a wiring diagram, organisation chart. But basically this shows us that the behavioural insights and the big society element was core to all the government's policies. Not saving the NHS, not helping people sleeping on the streets, but how they could actually get better at getting into our heads in order to form a new policy for a new society where everybody would be controlled by the government. This is not 1984. So people make policy, look for what they do, don't go by labels, don't treat them all as a group, look at the people, research them as individuals, but it's what they do and say gives the clue. And you should be worried, but this is the key thing, action immediately stops the worry.